Capo Beach, are we ready? In the stand and worship. Just want to welcome everybody who's outside, online. We love you guys. Excited to be here. Let's allow the presence of the Lord just to consume us. Let's spend some time with the one we love the very most, all right? Safest place we'll be. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We see your name in the dark and it changes everything. We see
Good morning, church. Would you turn to someone and give them a COVID-friendly fist bump and say welcome to church this morning? Well, I've mentioned this before, but I thought I'd make mention of it again. And until we kind of get it, I'll keep mentioning it. But if you are not sitting in the front row, you get the chance to look at the person's back of their head in front of you while I'm talking. No, I'm just kidding. You do get to do that, but that's what I'm making an announcement about. <laughs> Behind there, lower than their head, is a little dangly thing hanging on the seat. 
from that little nice little hook for you ladies to hang your purses on. And on that is a plastic card. On that card, there is a black cryptic looking box known as a QR code. We've all been accustomed now to what QR codes are. This is a little code that if you open your phone to your camera and scan over that with your camera, it'll automatically pop down a link. That link, when pressed, is all the relevant information happening at the church right now. So this is an easy thing for you to do at any point during the service. You'll, even during my message, if you want, that's fine. If I'm that boring, just go ahead and scan the church website, really. Like as a kid, when I was a kid, when I was super bored in church, I'd read the bulletin back to front, front to back. It was like way more exciting than the guy on the stage. And now I'm the guy on the stage. <laughs> Who would have thought that would have happened? Um, but you can scan that code and get any relevant information at our church. Also, uh, right adjacent to that, somewhere tucked in a thing to tuck stuff into, is some pens and a thick piece of paper that you can take notes on if you want. Uh, I get off, often asked for my notes but if I gave you my notes, you'd realize they don't make any sense whatsoever as to what I'm saying. Uh, they're very cryptic. It's more um, triggers for my mind, in a positive way triggers for my mind, uh, to kind of what I want to share with you all. So it, it doesn't really do well to send you my notes. Uh, but what you can do is anytime during the service, grab that thing and jot anything down that I'm saying or that anyone's saying up here, myself or any guest speakers, uh, but that's made available to you. So I just want you to know that that's there. We have a team that comes through every week and make sure they're all stuffed and make sure our website is to its best of its ability up to date with all the relevant information so that you can get access to all of those things. We are in a series, a new series, we're only two weeks into, it's a seven-week series called Devoted, moving from distraction to devotion. And the goal of this series is kind of like a refresher on how do we practice our Christian faith. And the reason why I'm doing this is because oftentimes uh, I stand up here and share truth with you or my interpretation of what scripture is saying, and that's great and well-meaning, and there's time for that. But, but this series is a little, is a little bit different. Uh, this series is meant to refresh you and how you go to God to get truth for yourself. Uh, in some ways, you can think of this series as an equipping series. And so last week, we started it with one of the spiritual disciplines of being devoted or one of the habits of grace of being devoted is taking time during the week to meditate on the goodness of God. And a lot of us went away all week long and took anywhere from three to five. I've heard stories of some that took 60 minutes to kind of take time to focus on God. After all, we meditate on things all the time. Usually things like our bank accounts, our inadequacies, or relational conflicts in our life. But what would happen in our life if we took that time instead to meditate on the goodness of God? And so a lot of people went away that last week and did that. And this week we're going to continue on because our goal is that Christ would have the room to shape the inner us to look more like him. But to do that, he needs time to do that in our lives. He needs us to make the time so that he can step in and shape us in that way. And so we make the time by meditating, not in the Eastern way of meditating, which is just emptying oneself out to empty oneself out, but in the biblical way, which is to empty oneself out so Christ can begin to fill us with the power of his spirit. Well, in the same manner, we're going to keep clicking along, and today we're going to talk about prayer. Now, you would think, Matt, doesn't meditation and prayer go together? They do, and of course, next week we'll talk about fasting, and meditation, prayer, and fasting in some ways go together, but I want to kind of pause and let each one breathe a little bit as we spread them out, and so that's why we're talking about these things, but they'll overlap week to week in different categories. Now, the challenge with spending only one time with you on a weekend talking about prayer is to maybe um, oversimplify it, which it needs to be simple, or dumb down it, which it is because it needs to be okay for our minds to handle it, but to neglect the grand power of prayer. And I don't want you to think that because we're only taking so, much, so many minutes with it that this is all the power it has in your life. No, we could take years into a series on prayer over and over and over again. But alas, we're trying to do other things at different times. And so, so bear with me this morning as I try to give you some truth of prayer, some understanding of prayer in the hopes to refresh your practice of prayer within your life. Because I don't think anyone needs to know that we should pray. 
Every human knows that we need to pray. It doesn't matter even what belief system you believe in, there's room made for some type of prayer. Whether it's moving to Mecca, whether it's being atop a hilltop with Buddhists in Thailand, whether it's with the young, old Pentecostal Korean woman in Korea. Belief systems know that prayer is key because prayer is connecting their human spirit to something greater. We as Christians pray because we believe in the truth of the Holy Spirit, and that's true for everyone. And the, the desire for us is that every child of God would be reconciled with our Heavenly Father so our human spirit could be connected to the true spirit, God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we're going to talk about. How does that occur? Because when we look at the life of Christ, one thing's for sure, when Jesus walked on earth, he came to show us how to truly be human. He was the designer of the human body, the designer of the human mind, heart, soul, and spirit. He knew what it was supposed to be like in the garden, and he knew now how we should live despite the sin that's come in. After all, he came to fix the broken problem. And so Christ could have just broadcasted to the world, I've come to save you, arrived in a human form for maybe a week, marched all the way to um, the, 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 the cross, given his life, resurrected, and in our week with him, he would have done what he needed to do, which was reconcile us back with our father. But that's not what he did. He actually allowed himself to be so vulnerable, to be put in the teenage woman's womb and be born into earth like the rest of us and then live a, a pretty much a full life as a man during that time. Why? To show us how to be human. To show us what we're to care about now that he has reconciled us in relationship to the Father. So his relationship to the Father was not broken. He still had that relationship. But now we get to look at his life, how he interacted with the Father, how he interacted with his calling, his purpose, how his worldview was, how he treated people different than him. We get to see his life and go, that's how to be human. And one thing is for sure, what we see from the life of Jesus is he took the time to pray which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like, do you pray to yourself? As you're like, yes, and, you know, we just asked that this food is multiplied in my name, amen. I, we see a picture of Jesus praying because praying wasn't about just getting permission for something or asking for something. Prayer was about his relationship with his father. And he was modeling that relationship with us. And so we see that he did that. He, he, he prayed before the launching of his public ministry. For 40 days, he fasted and prayed. And we'll talk about fasting next weekend. That Jesus, of all people, that, who wouldn't need to fast and pray, he still chose to fast and pray, showing us this is how you're to be human. He prayed before choosing his 12 disciples. He prayed at the news of his cousin John being killed. He prayed at the feeding of the 5,000. He prayed when facing death in such strenuous prayer that the blood vessels in his forehead burst and the blood mixed with water as the droplets fell to the ground. He prayed when his friends failed him in that garden while he was under distress. And after all, the church was launched during a prayer meeting. Praying is essential to our devotion to Christ. Prayer is the place that God shapes to enter us to look more like him. Now, to understand the early church, you have to understand Judaism. Because the early church was birthed out of the Jewish faith. And in many respects, the early church, while accepting what Christ had done for them, and walking in the fullness of that still kept to a lot of the practices that they had within their Jewish faith. One of them being praying. Uh, Paul and the early church, that very beginning, that first generation, would have had a habit of praying at least as individuals on their own three times a day. Because we know that Jews did that. They believed that their forefathers broke that down for them. Abraham told them to pray in Genesis 19. Isaac in Genesis 24. Jacob in Genesis 28. That because of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews had set up three different times in their day to spend in prayer to Yahweh. And so we know that, that. That though Paul doesn't write about that often, that was the practice of his life. That every day there was set apart time within his day to be conscious and in communion with Christ and his heavenly father. 
Perhaps that's the reason why the church survived the massive persecution that was upon them. Now the church, like all Christians do, got even more radical after the time of Paul. And within the first 100 to 200 years, there's recorded history that the church actually asked those that were a part of the church to not pray three times a day like the Jews did, but to pray seven times a day. How do they find the time? <laughs> I can't even think whole thoughts seven times a day with how busy I am. They would pray at their rising. They would pray at the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. They would pray when they would light the evening lamp. And for good measure, they would wake back up at midnight and pray one last time. They prayed a lot. And maybe the reason why the church was able to endure such massive persecution is because the people of the church were so connected to their father through prayer. But oftentimes when we think of prayer, we just think of words that we need to say. And, and, and alas, that's oftentimes where the problem is, right? Because we say a bunch of words, typically it's met, it's framed in some type of request, and a lot of us stop praying because we get discouraged because it appears like God never heard our prayer. Because he would have done what we asked him to do if he actually heard it, right? Because clearly he's not hearing us. Because he, he would do everything we said if he heard us, as if he's deaf, so we stop praying. But for those of us who have been on earth for a period of time, we might say, yeah, but now that I've been on earth for a while, I'm kind of glad God didn't give me what I asked for 10 years ago. It could have turned into a nightmare. Thankfully, God did actually hear my prayer, but answered it a better way as time went on. God, just because he doesn't do what we ask of him in the very moment, doesn't mean that he's not listening to our prayers. So maybe the first step to praying is not praying at all. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. He said, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. It's like something that we learn as kids, right? Like I think of my kid, you know, there's an extra Krispy Kreme donut in the kitchen. Dad, can I have it for breakfast? No, son, it's only 6 in the morning. You need to eat something more healthy before you eat that. Dad, can I have it for breakfast? No, son, I just said you need to have some. Dad, can I have it? No, son, I heard you. But I'm telling you, Dad, can I have the stinking donut and be quiet? It's like, it's like we've learned that behavior, right? Like if I just keep babbling to God, eventually he's just going to be like, give me what I want. Unfortunately, God's a little bit stronger than my willpower. <laughs> that he will hold out to give us appropriately what the things that we think we need. But after all, prayer isn't just about asking for things. It's more about the relationship to our Father. So I have a little acronym I'm going to walk you through this morning in the short time I have with you around the word pray. I did not create this. I heard it a long time ago. I've used it for a lot of years. I might have morphed it a little bit, maybe 16% of it's mine, but the rest of it. But there's nothing new. Someone probably said it some other way. But this is a little acronym that I use for the word pray that helps me be mindful about how I pray. Because one thing that I've learned, it's not only about taking the time to pray, it's also how I pray. And as I've learned to pray different, I've been encouraged to pray more. So here's the acronym. P is for pause. R is for remember. A is for ask. Y is for yield. Pray. Pause, remember, ask, yield. Pause. Why do we have to pause before we pray? Let me tell you why. Because every day we're in a storm of distraction. And it's difficult to hear God in that storm. There's a great story of Elijah in his interaction with, with Yahweh in the Old Testament found in 1 Kings. And I'm going to read that with you. It's, and then I'll break it down. It's a fascinating story. 1 Kings chapter 19 starting in verse 11. God's going to ask him to do something. You're going to see what he does. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. See, so often we want to see God in a fire. We want to see a sign. And so often we want to hear God, like the rumble of a massive wind. So often we want to feel God, like the shaking of an earthquake. But God's saying, no, I'm found in the gentle whisper. That when you learn to hear my whisper, then you're learning to hear me. And whispers are close. I can remember when my kids started to learn the idea of secrets. You know, you know it's weird with kids, you start seeing their sin nature grow in them at some point. Like, we can keep secrets. And then later it's, I can lie. And then later it's like, I can get away with anything. And then it's just like, oh my gosh, well, you need Jesus. But when they're young, it's all innocent, right? They want to, they want to tell secrets. And, and I can remember as clear as day, my son wanted to tell me a secret. And he's sitting there, sweaty, because we're in Hawaii. He's snotty for some, because every kid went a little snotty. He's got cheese that's packed in his teeth. And he grabs my hand and he goes, I want to tell you a secret. And he starts whispering on my ear while putting cheese that's in my ear and snotting all over my face. Because he wants to tell me a secret. Because he heard his sisters telling secrets, he wants to tell secrets. So he understood that to tell a secret, you have to whisper. And to whisper, you have to be very, very, and in his case, very close to someone's ear. Well, God minus the snotty nose and the cheese its wants to be that close to whisper to your ear. Whispering is an intimate thing. Whispering is a close thing. Whispering isn't happening from far away. Whispering isn't happening on a mountaintop. Whispering isn't found in fire and shaking of earth and loud wind. Whispering is found in stillness and closeness. Whispering is intimate. And so we need to pause before we pray so we can listen for his whisper. Because that's how God wants to communicate to you. Not so that he can be hard to be understood. No, so that he can be close to you. So he can be intimate with you. So he can be that close. That he loves you and cares and wants to have a relationship with you so much that he wants to come that close to you. He doesn't want to send you an email. He doesn't want to put a, have you follow his Facebook account and make random Facebook posts that you're supposed to catch at some point. He doesn't want to just stand up with a megaphone or gather you in a large stadium. He wants to get close and intimate, close to your ear and whisper at a volume that you can hear him. How can we hear him if we don't pause amidst our storm of distraction? So before we even begin to pray, we, we pause. The second thing I, I've learned is that after I begin to pause, then as my mind begins to run wild, oftentimes what helps me is in my pausing, instead of being distracted because I'm quiet now, I'll use my mental power to remember God's goodness. So before I've even said anything, I'm taking the time to pause and then using my mental intellect to remember who God is, the God I'm praying to. Remember his goodness and his graciousness. After all, when Jesus taught us how to pray with his prayer, the first part of his prayer was our Father who art in heaven. As if to say, be reminded, before you pray, you're praying to your Father who's in heaven. Remember who you're praying to. Not our general at the military base. Not our great teacher at the university. Not our president in the White House. No, our Father who's in heaven heaven, to be conscious that we have a heavenly father, to remember that we have that father. Now, now the Jews would do this often. They would do after their first morning prayer, because remember the Jews prayed three times, they would do these things called the six remembrances, that as part of their morning prayer, they would remember every day six things about God, according to the stories that they held close. They would remember their exodus from Egypt to remind themselves that before we pray, we know that our God saves. They would re remember the, the revelation Moses received at Sinai to know that God, the one that they serve, gives them teaching. 
They would remember the Amalek's attack on Israel to remember that God protects those protects Israel when those that come and attack them. They would remember the golden calf and the rebellion in the desert with Aaron to remember that God was kind to them despite their idolatry. They would remember Miriam's negative speech and the, and the, pus, the punishment that came because of that, remembering that God disgusts negative speech. And then lastly, they'll remember the Sabbath to know that God made the world around them and originally God said all of it was good. That the Jews would make this practice before saying anything, they would pause to hear the whisper and remember the greatness, the goodness, the graciousness of God. How quick we are to speak. And God saying, well, I want to be quick to speak, but you're not taking the time to listen. So we pause, we remember, and then we ask. Now, asking is an interesting concept because if we really think about it, when we started to learn to ask, we started asking things when we were kids. And judging by how we were treated when we asked for things, that kind of set us up as adults on if we are willing to ask or not ask. If we had harsh parents... And typically as adults, we didn't ask for help from people because all we can hear in the back of our minds is our dad saying no, or our dad saying you figure it out, or our dad saying you go do it. So those of us that heard that, maybe were less often to ask. Some of us were met with gracious responses, and we learned the, the need to be able to ask and work with others. So now we live in a world where we, we're comfortable asking. Some of us, maybe we ask a little too much. But asking is an interesting thing because asking in and of itself is a very Asking in and of itself is a very relational and vulnerable thing to do. It's relational and it's vulnerable. There's a story in Mark that kind of gives you a bit of this picture. Mark chapter 10. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up. They said, come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want? Me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Now we read this story, and we can skip over the vulnerability of what's occurring here. First of all, the man doesn't see Jesus coming because he's blind. But he hears him coming. But though the man did not have the working of his physical eyes, it would appear that his spiritual eyes were working very well. That he was willing to risk and be vulnerable to shout in public because that was the only way he might get Jesus to pay attention to him and scream and ask for healing. Not only that, the people around him criticize him. They shout out to him, just shut up, crazy blind guy. But then he caught Jesus' attention. See, there, there is an asking in relationship with Christ, but we have to be willing to be vulnerable and know that it's a relational task when we ask Jesus to help us, to be involved in something, to be a part of something, to give us understanding on something, to give us wisdom in a given situation. So often I think we think we ask or we intend to ask, but we don't ever actually ask because we're scared of hearing the word no. But then <laughs> that's not a relationship, is it? If there's no risk involved, if there's no vulnerability involved, there's no relationship involved. But I think once we've paused and we're remembering and we're hearing his whisper, we begin to actually ask for the things that he wants to presently do in our life. And maybe the things that we sat down with on our list to begin praying for actually begins to change once we've paused, heard his whisper, and began to remember who he was. All of a sudden, the things that we thought were the pressing things on our mind are no longer the pressing things on our mind. And all of a sudden, our human spirit, in connection with his Holy Spirit, begins us to give us the right words of what to ask for. And then we begin to ask things in his name. 
pray. Pause. Remember. Ask. And the last one, yield. Because at the end of our time, we just need to be still and know that he is God. At, at the end of the time, the goal is that we've now recognized that we are not God, but he is God. And we are limited in our understanding, but he is unlimited in his understanding. And we are limited in our wisdom, but he is unlimited in his wisdom. And after we've taken that time, if anything, our affection has been turned towards him. And we realize he's the big guy in the room. He is our father. He has our best interest in mind. And he knows the best timing for the things that we're making requests for. So what do we do? We yield. We take time to show up, shut up, and look up. Say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to babble on like the Gentiles anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm connected to you. And if anything, I'm learning to relate to you. Bishop Stephen Verney puts it like this. It is not that I am contemplating the divine love, but that the divine love is contemplating me. That's the goal of our prayer life. To get to the point to realize that it's not about me thinking about him. It's about me realizing he's thinking about me. It, the goal isn't that I would be mindful of him. It's that I would be mindful that his mind is full of me. And that keeps me here in a place of yielding. If I can encourage you with anything of what I've said in the last 28 minutes, it'd be summed up in this when it comes to prayer. Keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. Keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. I don't think you struggle with the simple part. I don't think you struggle with the real part. But I know where I struggle with, the keeping it up part. But when I look at the life of the people in the New Testament church, when I look at how they were consumed with who Christ is in their life and it allowed them to adore one of the greatest persecutions against the church that it had ever experienced, it only could be because they had that deep prayer relationship with their Heavenly Father. Church, I can't encourage you enough this morning to consider to take the time daily during this week, maybe not three times, probably not seven times, but maybe at some point to just pause, remember, ask, and yield. And that in your life of prayer, you might see Christ shape you to be more like him. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, give me the words. How do you pray after talking about prayer for almost half an hour? <laughs> Father, we're making the space here. That's why we are here this week. We're not here to earn favor. We're here because in our week of chaos, we make this space to go. This is a space where I'm in devotion to Christ. And so let us remember that you are good to us. You are gracious to us. You are our heavenly Father. And Father, I ask for everyone here that in that remembering and in that pausing, that our asking would not just be the asking for the things on our mind, but we would begin to ask for the things that are already on your mind for us. And that in doing so, we would yield, knowing that you are God and we are not, and you will bring about the goodness according to your will for us. Because you love us and care for us, and you're better than any earthly father, as you are our heavenly father. Jesus, I pray that for anyone that might be here tonight that feels like their prayers are falling on deaf ears, may they be encouraged that you are not deaf, but maybe they just need to pause to hear your gentle whisper. And that maybe people here are discouraged because you haven't done what they've asked of you, but maybe we just need to let go of our expectations of you and yield in knowing that you're God and you have it under control. Father, maybe we be encouraged that because of the death and resurrection of your son, we are now seen as clothed in white before you and that we can boldly approach your throne in relationship with you because you've already accepted us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue in worship. As you know, we're we just getting started. Uh, we're going to continue in worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you're visiting here, you don't have to participate if you don't want to. Uh, but this is our way of giving and sowing into what God's doing here. And then we're going to move into a time of communion that Stuart and I will lead you in. And 
We'll have a short prayer before we do it. But when you receive the cup, feel free to take that at any point over the rest of the service and the worship we have planned. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart because you're the one that guides my heart Cause Lord I need you oh I See you one more time. So, Father, we thank you that your son came to show us how to be human and to give his life to reconcile us with you. We thank you for his body that was broken for us to give us the sustenance on which to live in this life today. And his blood that was poured out for us to accept us and love us. May we be conscious as we take today this element, these elements, Father, that you have accepted us. You have loved us right here, right where we are, in the midst of all the chaos that might be around us. We thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for being willing to come and live on this earth and go to the cross to make our relationship right with your father. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are, Lord, where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in When I cannot stand, I'll fall on me. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Teach my soul. So teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
Oh God, how I need you. Oh my Jesus, how I need you. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you.
never stop, you never stop working. Who 
took our sin, God's perfect offering upon the throne. Hey, uh, you know, miracles do happen through prayer. Craig wanted me to tell you that he's actually taking vacation this week. So praise God, right? Whew, what a time he's had. Hey, there's another class starting. Um, I'd share my faith if just I knew how. That starts on the uh, uh, 13th over here in room number one. Um, the men's barbecue uh, is going to happen here on the uh, 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. right here in the uh, cafe. All you have to do is just call. Let us know you're coming. And uh, nothing to prepare for that. And today is uh, Saints Graduation Day for the children moving from elementary into the junior high, for the junior high moving into high school, and the high school moving on into their uh, uh, college level classes. So, uh, you know, bless them. You know, the prayer room is always open. You know, the earth has been moved through that prayer room. Matt talked about prayer today. You know, it reminds me of the song Surrounded. You know, it may look like I'm surrounded. Those are all the distractions we have in our lives, even some of them you're thinking of right now. You know, to, you know, but I'm surrounded by you, to the devotion, you know, in Matt's message, devoting our time to pray in Christ and let him speak into our lives and what he wants from us. During the first service, I was sitting here. God gave me the scripture, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you. 